Good morning. We welcome you to worship today. For some reason, it feels a little earlier than normal today. We, we know that you guys are nice and energetic and ready to sing, though, so we are so glad to have you with us today. As that today we do celebrate Lent 4, as we celebrate God's gracious gifts and His overflowing and abundant promises. As today we celebrate not only is God our generous Father, but He is also that gifted craftsman who is at work within our lives. And so at this time I invite the congregation to please stand and face the cross as we begin with our procession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, throughout these 40 days, you prayed and kept the fast. Inspire in us repentance for our sin, and free us from our past. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? but with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our own sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, 
God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, while we were still dead in our sin, you came as one of us to die for us and bring us to eternal life. Give us strength of faith to look up to you each day of our sojourn until we see you face to face in eternity. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading today is from Psalm 63. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied, as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with, my, with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson comes to us from the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, in which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand.
Our Holy Gospel for this fourth Sunday in Lent comes to us from the 10th chapter of St. Mark. As Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments that do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teach me, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go. Sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible. But with God, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. We now join together in speaking our common Christian faith as we join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of body, and the life of the last one. At this time, the congregation may be seated as we take a moment for our children's message. If there are any children who are in attendance are more than welcome to come forward, or they can remain in their seats if that is more comfortable for them. Actually, All right. And we also welcome those children that are joining us online as well. So glad to have you guys here today. So the question that I want us to go ahead and think about. So why do we give birthday presents? Is it, what's there? Are they, are they, you know, what do you do to earn a birthday present? Is it our birthday presents really given as that way to just, because we're just, you know, like so awesome and stuff? Is it because, I don't know, we're, we're so perfect in just every way possible? Is it just kind of people's way of saying, you are such a gift in my life that I just can't help but give a gift to you? That I like to think that that's what my mom's saying to me anytime she gives me a birthday gift. I really don't know why she gives birthday gifts to my brother or my two sisters. But is that, is that what birthday gifts are all about? Are they earned? Are they deserved? Are they things that we somehow have worked so hard to get? I mean, just think about it. That each and every year comes along and we're given a gift just because. I mean, if anyone deserved a gift on our birthday, it may not be us. It's probably us giving a gift to our mother in thanks to what she has done. I mean, this kind of thinks, makes me think about our reading today from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. See, when it comes to birthday gifts, is that mom does all of the work, but we get all of the attention. It's kind of the same thing with God. 
is that God does all of the work. He does all of the saving. He does all of the loving. He does all of that fact to give us the gift of Jesus and everything that he does. And yet we, we're the ones that get all of the attention, all of the blessings, all of the gifts. I mean, did we deserve that love of God? Is that were we so perfect and holy that we earned it? No. Is that were we somehow so good or so blessed that we earned it? No. But how does Paul put it in our reading today? Is that Paul says that God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, that he made us alive together with Jesus Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not the result of works so that no one may boast. So how, does, how does Paul put it? That God is the one who's rich in grace. God is the one who's giving the gift. Why? Because God's the one who's done the work. God's the one who's full of grace, kindness, and love. Because God gives good gifts. And he gave us the greatest gift in Jesus Christ. And so at this time, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you give to us the very gift of Jesus and all of those other blessings that come because of him. That we have not deserved them but that you have presented them freely to us. Help us to rejoice each day in every gift that you have given. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And so at this time in our service, we continue with our hymn of the day. So today we turn our attention to the word of our Lord in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. That grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So we probably feel like we've heard this passage before. So we've heard it all too well as Lutheran Christians who celebrate that very gift of God's free grace to us. But Paul in this passage is indeed in every single way pressing in upon us a question. Is that with all of his figurative language, with all of the powerful emphasis, with all of the illustration that he gives, is that Paul is asking us a question. And that question is that how do you view God? So that's our first sermon point today. That how do you view 
God. In the midst of everything that is there is that who do we say that he is and how do we act him to be? That is he stingy or is he generous? Is that he angry and upset or is he loving and caring? Is that how do you picture and see him in your mind? Because Paul puts several pictures before us today in Ephesians chapter 2. To think on and to reflect over of what it is that is there. Is that Paul begins to unpack this very beautiful present of a God who is generous, who is forgiving, who is loving. A God who is in so many ways desiring to give freely to all. But when we contrast our epistle reading with our gospel for today, is that how does all people see God? Do all see him as that generous, giving, gracious, forgiving person that he is? But we might ask the same thing of ourselves. That we may give voice to how we say God is or how we view him to be. But within our day-to-day life of how we live and how we act and how we respond to him is that are we giving testimony to what it is that we claim him to be? Or is there something there within us that also can be found in our gospel reading today? Because what do we find when that young man, desperately seeking not only the Lord's advice, but seeking the very blessing of where God would lead him in this time, This young man comes running up, throws himself on his knees, and pleads for just a moment of Jesus' time that he just has one simple thing to ask. What must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Do you hear it in his question? Then what must I do to earn it? What must I do to deserve it? What must I accomplish? What is my part, no matter how great or how small, what is my portion in this whole exchange? That even though he's talking about an inheritance, you know, something that usually comes to you entirely devoid of you having done anything, that there's one thing that has to happen for an inheritance to be passed. Somebody else has to die. I mean, Jesus says to this young man who now comes seeking and searching and looking for what is missing in his life, that Jesus says there's just one little thing. Now, I know Jesus says, says, go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and follow me. But I at least get the sense that there's a little bit more to that. I mean, what is that one thing that this man is lacking? I mean, is it meaning? Is it purpose? Is it contentment with all of the blessings that God has given? Is it simply that enjoying of that overflowing grace that God has already given? Is it it freedom from all of those things that possess him? Is that while that very act of now somehow getting rid of all of these things that stand in his way is certainly that thing, that there is one thing that he lacks that free gift of Jesus. But he's determined to earn it, to deserve it, to find in his very way to somehow respond to what is now offered in God. But what does an inheritance mean? What does it look like? An inheritance is supposed to be something that is gifted and given, something that is an image of pure grace. But even in our day and age, so many times is that even this can sometimes be turned into one more thing that needs to be earned or deserved. So what do I mean by that? Is that there's 
other colorful images, but this one I think fits the bill. Is that multi-billionaire Leona Helmsley, when she passed away, is that she put certain stipulations in her will as she began to divvy out her inheritance. Is that first and foremost is that her beloved dog got a $15 million trust set up. So hold on, wait a minute, I want to be correct. 12 million, I apologize for my mistake. A $12 million trust and the person that now took care of the dog would earn $60,000 a year simply by caring for the dog. But her own kids and grandkids that each only received $5 million in that very inheritance under the very stipulation that each and every year that they were to appear at her and her husband's grave and sign that guest registry. Otherwise, whatever remained of the inheritance would simply be taken away. <laughs> so that's earning something that should have been freely given. That not only did she put that in her will, but she said that there were some of her grandchildren that were excluded entirely from her will for reasons that are known to them. Ooh. <laughs> Is that how life works? that we need to put in our part or we need to find our way is that we need to somehow keep people happy. Otherwise, we're afraid to lose out on what is there. Is this not the very thing that this man now worries about? He said, what must I do? There must be something, even in the midst of everything, is that I am still not content or happy and I am still afraid and worried. And so he is still seeking and searching and trying to find his very place. But what does Paul say to us in Ephesians today? He speaks to us of the very fact of our spiritual bankruptcy. I mean, just read those very first three verses of, of Ephesians 2, and we see just how indebted we are, that there is no way that we can not only pay the bill. But the fact is, is that there's no way that we can earn it. For Paul says that we are dead in our trespasses. There's nothing that a dead person can do to earn it or deserve it or make it. Then what does Paul say? Paul says that God has raised us up, given us new life, that he is the one who took the divine initiative and now made us alive in him. But see, this is where we go back to that question, not only of how we view God, but how do we see him and his very connection of what it is that we see, but how do we live in that very relationship with him? How do we live on a day-to-day -day basis? Are we still living like we have our nose to the grindstone that we must earn it and we must work hard for it? That there at least must be some part. Is that some out there might say that we need to say a special prayer or give ourselves in a special way or offer our God in some special response? Is that what is it that Paul now proclaims to us? That in no uncertain terms, he wants to put that very focus, not upon us somehow earning our place, but on God alone. For God asks a second important question today in Paul's letter, is that how do you view your relationship with God? That is it a matter of give and take? Is it a matter of gift and then responsibility? Is it that very thing that I have to live up to what has now been given? That are there strings attached? See, Paul gives two strong images today for us to think about. Two pictures that indeed capture that very rich fact of what God desires to give. 
is that he first off gives the image of a generous father. That as it says, that we were by nature children of wrath. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, he made us alive together with Christ. Is that Paul talks about this unsurpassing riches that God has to offer as he goes on to say from there that this is not a result of works, but it is a gift so that no one may boast. See, I thought about how do we view this image? Is that how do we think about this very thing that is there? Because so many times that when a gift is given is that we feel that certain strings are attached, right? Is that as I thought about that, there was one thing that, an image that came to mind. I don't know, blame it on old movies or things like that, is that you don't see too many briefcases around anymore. Is that the last time I think I saw a briefcase is that I think it was like the, um, you know, what was the Howie Mandel show with the, you know, with the cases and everything? Is that, see... The fact is is that, blame it on old movies or things like that, but there's an image that sticks in my mind, is that the briefcase in so many movies that is, you know, filled with money, is that let's just go ahead and say that such a gift was offered to you. Now you'll notice I'm a pastor, these are singles, you know, I I hate to uh, admit it. But the fact is, is that if somebody offered you a briefcase full of money, what would your response be? Is that would your response be, okay, well, well, what's going to come as that very, you know, kind of gift? What responsibilities are going to come? What now strings come attached? Is that what, why is this and what is this? But this is the image that Paul gives to us today, that God offers his riches, his treasures. He offers to us something of unimaginable wealth. That how do we respond? That God offers it to us is that will we receive the gift as the gift that is given, or must we earn it and find our way in it? See, in this life, we have to ask ourselves a question. Is that what do we want to be rich in? Are we simply seeking to be rich in money, rich in possessions, rich in so many other things, or are we those who see the very riches that God offers to us? That he is the one who is rich in mercy, great in love, benevolent in all of his kindness, the one who overflows with everything that is there, and he gives gifts that there are no strings attached. Not only did you not deserve it or earn it, but there is no repaying of it. That he offers it to you Now, if you receive such a gift, that will it not change your life? I mean, if if you were given a briefcase full of money by someone other than me, because this is staying with me, (laughs) but if you were offered a briefcase full of money, would it not change some aspects of your life? But the fact is is that if God has given us his free gift of grace, does it not change our lives? See, that's the second image that Paul gives to us today. Not just the image of a generous father, but he gives to us the very image of a gifted craftsman. A gifted craftsman who is at hard work within our lives, as it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That God is that very craftsman who is now at work in our lives. He is that gifted artist who is shaping and forming and at work within us. 
that I don't know about your skills, but I think about where I started many years ago with my craftsman quite abilities. That back in early college is that I made the most beautiful VHS cassette tape holder that is known to man. Yes, VHS tape. I, I don't know if any kids know what those things are. <laughs> but this thing, it wasn't sanded. It wasn't straight. It didn't have a back on it. Is that there was everything wrong with it. <laughs> that was the year before I went ahead and I stained our coffee table for my dorm room. That sure enough, yes, everything for the next year stuck to that coffee table. Is that we had pieces of newspaper stuck to it for years beyond that year of college. The fact is that if we are the ones who are, are doing the work, if we are the ones who are there, is that I'm afraid of how that work of art will be done. But if we are in the hands of a gifted craftsman, of one who in all things has not only shaped and created us, for that is what Paul desires to call to our minds today, that he is the one who has created us in Christ Jesus. That out of nothing, out of the very darkness of time, God all of a sudden brought forth the man with no work of his own with nothing that he deserved, that God created and it was. And so the same thing is true of our salvation. The same thing is true of our life. That Richard Lenski puts it in that very terms of the fact that out of the nothingness of our spiritual bankruptcy, God creates his riches. <laughs> That out of the shoddiness of our work, God creates his beautiful masterpiece. That just as the sun was meant to shine, just as the rose was meant to give forth its very beautiful scent, so also were mankind made, created, shaped, and formed for good works. See, Paul puts these two things right there. Something that is a free gift, that if we receive it, if it is something that is given to us, it will change us. That we don't need to earn it, and we do not need to worry that there are strings attached. He gives it. But doesn't it change us? It changes our perspective, it changes our lives, it changes what it is that is there. That I've asked that question before, that are good works necessary? Necessary for salvation by no means. Paul puts it in no uncertain terms. But are good works necessary for the good of our neighbor? for the good of others, for the good of this world, for the very good of glorifying the God who has now come and claimed us as his own, that we were created in Christ Jesus for those good works. And that work has been prepared. It's been ready before us that he is the one who has already done the work, that when he cried out upon that cross, it is finished. Our salvation was won. And now he invites us to simply walk, to walk in those things that have been prepared for us, to borrow from that sermon from Sam Trammell just a few weeks ago, is that Christ is the one who has already carried the cross before us, that he has paved the path. And so now we only follow in what he has done. And so may he who is not only our generous father, but that very gifted craftsman, may he be at work in your life as we give all glory to him who lived for us, who died for us, and loved us enough to give us everything that he has so that we may be rich, rich in so many ways, 
that we may share that same forgiveness, that same love, that same kindness to others. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you have given to us. I thank you for the very gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. Is that through him is that you have raised us to new life. Is that we pray, O Lord, that you would be with us each and every day. That we may live within our relationship as those who see all that you have given. And may it continue to change us each day. All this we pray in your Son's holy and precious name. Amen. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and put that away. At this time in our service, there is a, we do have a couple of announcements that we would like to share with you. As that the first thing that we would like to share with you is just an invitation to continue to join us for our midweek Advent service. Advent, our midweek Lent services is that our Lenten services continue this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. both on site as well as online as we continue with the places of the Passion. We hope that you are able to join us for that. That just a reminder that this is that final weekend to submit those Easter lily order forms is that they are available out on the tables in the narthex or you can contact the church office um, the next day uh, and go ahead and make sure to get that in is that you can either drop them in the offering boxes or deliver them to the church office as well. Is that one other announcement that we would like to share with you uh, is that it's not in the bulletin uh, because you know, ultimately you know, things came into place late in the week is that one thing that uh, we need to inform you is that we've had to make a, uh, a difficult decision um, in regard to the recycling bins out on our north parking lot. For many, many years is that we've been blessed to have that opportunity both for our Calvary family as well as our community. Is that it once upon a time started as a fundraiser. Is that something that brought in money here? Is that unfortunately because of a number of misuse and abuse of the recycling bins over the past months is that we've been continued to be hit with many fees, with many contamination charges, with all kinds of things that it is costing us a lot. <laughs> And so unfortunately, because of that misuse, is that we are going to be discontinuing those recycling bins on March 31st, is that we may in a few months decide to go ahead and reevaluate once you know, that has you know, happened and begin to open that up to our Calvary family uh, as a part of that or our general operations. Uh, but that's just something that we found that it's just completely not you know, functional as it's been and just there's not going to be an easy way for us to address those issues with so many community members uh, utilizing it. And so just a reminder, so effective March 31st is that those will be uh, removed from our North parking lot. Uh, but with those announcements being made is that we now turn to our Lord in prayer. I invite you to please stand. One brief update to our printed uh, prayers and the announcements today. Uh, we're praying for Violet Fiorello, who is undergoing testing. As God's chosen ones, beloved sons and daughters of God, saved not by our own works, but by grace through faith in Christ, let us pray for all people according to their needs. For people of every nation, that all may be delivered from warfare, oppression, and violence, and live in peace and safety, which God intends for his creatures. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who serve in the armed forces of our nation, that they may defend the innocent, maintain justice, and establish peace. Comfort and guide the families of those who are deployed far away. By the death and resurrection of your Son, reconcile us with our enemies that all may bear witness to your power and peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who are sick, facing surgery, or convalescing, including we pray this day for Margie Mason and Treva Gerke. We lift up Nancy Miller and Janet Polk. We lift up David Barber and Melody, daughter of Ray and Jan Main. We ask God's blessing on all of those who are hospitalized, preparing for or recovering from surgery, and ask for his blessing as well upon all of those medical staff who care for them. We ask for strength and healing for Chris Hyatt, for Linda Heckman, for Kathy Rudy, and John Ford. Lord, we ask that you would bless each of them with strength, not just of body, but of spirit and of faith, that they in all of these things might draw near to you for the peace which you alone can provide. 
Lord, we ask that you would be with uh, Violet Fiorello and with Allie and Chris and their entire family as she undergoes testing, that you would grant them encouragement and peace, that you are indeed in, that she is indeed in your hands and in your care throughout all of this uncertainty that all of these in their sickness may be turned to health and that they may experience the love of God through our care and concern. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for all those who travel, that their journeys may be safe. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the church throughout the world, that during this Lenten season, we may intensify our repentance, prayer, and generosity so that all the world may be blessed through us. We lift up as well the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Ghana, where Calvary supports LCMS missionaries Steve and Cynthia Schumacher. For all of these and all of those who are serving the Lord across the world, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all of those who are experiencing times of sadness and sorrow, especially the family and friends of Lynn Montagnier, that they may find rest for their wearied hearts and minds and comfort in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For guests who are joining us in worship today, that Christ bless their hearing of the word with faith, understanding, and joy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the people of this congregation, that is God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, We may say and do those things that give glory to God and spread the love of Christ in all the world. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the missionaries connected to and supported by this congregation, that they may each serve as instruments of God's great love. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Saved by grace through faith in Jesus, we entrust our prayers to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. Hear us, O Lord, as we pray in Jesus' name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Remember that you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, go in his peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.
Glory to you. 